your reaction to this move by Trump's lawyers? Well, it's a move engendered to um, come up with as much delay as is possible. It's not about the substance. Uh, the D.C. Circuit basically shredded the opinion, uh, the, the contentions of the, of the Trump lawyers, mm -hmm. um, really kind of gave it the back of the hand. And I think what is a really comprehensive and well-done opinion, my hope would be that the Supreme Court will look at the nature of what was raised, which I think is pretty frivolous, and the comprehensive nature of that opinion, uh, and not take the case. But the purpose of, of the filing is to uh, is simply to delay the proceedings. And so this is one of those times where the court could take the case, reject Donald Trump's entire arguments and theory of an autocratic presidency, but delay the thing so long that it would, as a practical matter, help him. Should the justices think about that sort of reverse outcome? I think so. I mean, you know, it, it, you can't look at it in a vacuum. I mean, say, well, maybe the Supreme Court should make a, a decision on a case that is of first impression. And I can understand that argument to, a, you know, to some extent. On the other hand, um, if you look at the oral argument, if you look at the, um, the opinion that was written by the D.C. Circuit, you, you see that there is no substance to those claims. And uh, uh, if you have to do a bit of balancing here, uh, I think, on the part of the Supreme Court, uh, making sure that the American people have a vital piece of information before them, and that is the guilt or innocence of a, a proposed president, that, I think, outweighs mm. the notion of uh, doing something that is of, um, of first impression. You say first impression. That's the idea that some arguments are so important because the Supreme Court hasn't ruled on them yet, and we all understand this is new because no other president's gotten himself yeah. indicted. No other president's ever said that I am totally above the law. We've, we've had disputes about, you know, what's the reach of the civil law when it comes to a president. No president has ever said I am above the criminal law. And uh, the D.C. Circuit, uh, in a very comprehensive opinion, kind of step by step, looked at all of the contentions that they raised and um, dismissed them. So I have a very legalistic question for uh -oh. you, but, uh -oh. it's, <laughs> but it's fitting. Uh, if you were teaching your Solicitor General, as you oversaw that department, the talks to the Supreme Court, or a law student, where is the tension between first impression, you just explained why sometimes that means the court should take it, mm -hmm. and dangerous, or what I call bananas arguments? Uh, the fact that the argument of first impression here is one we've never heard before is partly a demerit. No former president, even Nixon, claimed this level of powers, it was quite literally described as a license to kill. Should that cut against it? Otherwise, any politician can say it's first impression. No one's ever said something this extreme before. Yeah, I mean, if if the Supreme Court had an unlimited amount of time, I mm -hmm. think it might be a good thing for the court to say, you know, we're going to put a nail in the heart of this mm -hmm. kind of argument. But they don't have uh, an unlimited amount of time. We do have an election that will happen in the beginning of November. Uh, and I think when you have on file now, uh, a D.C. Circuit opinion that I think will stand the test of time uh, as a guide for future litigants, uh, future presidents who might want to raise the same things that, uh, that Donald Trump has. I'm not sure there's a need for a Supreme Court opinion here, even though, even though it is a matter of first impression. Yeah, very interesting coming from you, and I know how seriously you take this stuff. Uh, you may or may not remember, because you're busy, but you sat at this table when the Mueller report first started to come out. Yeah. And you said as a legal matter, the prosecutor, and I checked this today, mm -hmm. you said, quote, cleared the president of Russian collusion. The idea that there might have been a criminal charge around that alleged activity, which there was not. And you described it as thus. Now we have this special counsel, her, who has not found basis for any charge, hypothetically or otherwise, clearing President Biden. Um, and yet in that report, as you know, uh, he writes... Biden is, however, quote, an elderly man with a poor memory that in Mr. Hur's, I guess, um, lay, non-expert medical opinion, he thinks Biden has, quote, diminished faculties. No footnote for that. And, quote, Biden did not remember when his son, Bo, died, uh, an extemporaneous comment that doesn't seem legally relevant in which the president and his lawyers have strenuously rebutted. Um, your assessment of both the findings of this report, and whether that was out of bounds. Well, uh, it seems to me that based on the evidence that has been adduced, that the findings are correct, that in fact there's no basis to charge the president with, uh, with, with a crime. But the language surrounding those findings, I think it was, a lot of it was gratuitous um, and not based, as best I can tell, on anything that was relevant to uh, their conclusions. Does that raise questions then about the goal? Because 
you've handled yeah. and overseen a lot of cases. And I'll just remind everyone, you could charge or you could not charge. You have a declination. That's it. Yeah. Now, have you, do you usually see in a declination the then public release of material, say, about um, that person's deceased son or their discussion of it? No, you don't usually see that, but this is a little different in the sense that he's a special counsel working under regulations that require a report be filed. But even with this, those special circumstances, the language that he used and the focus that he put on certain matters, I think, goes, uh, is out of bounds. Um, I don't need to know about what the president knew or did not know. I'm not saying that he did not know, you know, when mm -hmm. uh, Bo Biden died. But what's the relevance of that to his retention of uh, classified documents? If you look at the Pence special prosecutor, no one even kind of remembers that case mm -hmm. because that guy, I think it was a guy, did it by um, the book. He looked at the case, made a determination that there was no violation, filed a report as such, and it just went away. You know, Does this I, call, let me ask you this. Does this call special counsel Hurd's credibility into question? Well, I think he's either extremely naive or he is a partisan. I read in the newspapers that um, apparently the uh, lawyers for President Biden had the ability to raise with him and did raise with mm -hmm. him concerns about the use of the language. So this had to be something in his mind that he was thinking, you know, well, all right, somebody's raised an objection uh, and how this will be viewed um, politically, if not legally. And he nevertheless went ahead. So as I said, he is either unbelievably naive or <laughs> unfortunately yeah. um, partisan. We've gotten to talk sometimes over the years. I don't know how you feel now, but I, I sometimes feel that we are living through strange times. Mm -hmm. Uh, the prior president did not do much to cooperate with the special counsel probe. Right. And we should mention, in fairness to President Trump, there are defenses and mechanisms that the president can use. Bill Clinton did a limited testimony. Uh, from what we can tell, President Biden did the most fulsome testimony we've seen of any recent president in a long time. Definitely more so than the last several, including Bush, who did a, a non-under oath interview for the uh, Libby leak. So, on the one hand, he cooperates extensively. Then, as mentioned, on the criminal question, he's cleared. But he comes out the same day of the public release of the report and sounds off. Uh, and many people I could think could understand emotionally where he's coming from. But what I say is strange is full cooperation and then sounds off. Take a listen to what the president said. I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. Your assessment of that, and was he within his bounds to respond this way? Yeah, I think he was totally within bounds. I mean, he's talking about the death of his son. He's talking mm -hmm. about the death of his boy. That was a father reacting to an assertion that he didn't know when his son died. Uh, I'd be just as and I'm going to say it, just as pissed off as, mm. as he was if somebody said something like that to me. You know, my dad died uh, in 1998, uh, two days ago, you know? Um, and if I'm under pressure, uh, if I'm in the middle of, I think, two days of, uh, of examination, if I'm dealing with the Israeli um, crisis, the right, Gaza as crisis as he was, you know, that might be a date that I might forget. I'm not saying that he did forget, but if he did, that is something that in some ways is understandable. But the, the larger question is, why the hell are you asking that question? Right. What does that have to do with the retention of classified documents? Uh, I'd like, again, as I said, I'd like to think, I'd like to think that at best, <laughs> this prosecutor was extremely naive, a rube, perhaps. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I worry that at some level of his consciousness, you know, he's a, a Republican mm. appointee, and he's thinking, you know, I want to have a life beyond right. the, um, what I'm saying in connection with this investigation, and that well, might have shaded what he, uh, what he put in the report. Look, people are going to make up their own minds. That's the best part of this country. But you've been known to be fair and pretty crisp on these matters. I mentioned what you said when the Mueller report came out. You saying he's either a rube, an idiot, or letting partisan uh, motivations infect this is, is, is quite a statement. And this goes to how the attorney general has operated. And we, you know, you, you could tell us more than most what a tough job it is, but there's been increasing concerns, some can even come in the Biden White House, about Attorney General Garland. I'll show the prosecutors that he's put in, case, in place, because he had Jack Smith come in, but relatively late. Then you have the Biden case, as mentioned, he put a special counsel for that, special counsel for Hunter Biden. Menendez, a Democratic senator, no special counsel, uh, although 
you know, you could have one. I'll remind viewers, you have a background in handling the public integrity section, which is what these highly sensitive cases. Um, number one, has Attorney General Garland relied on too many special counsels, and does the Biden case raise any questions about that? And number two, um, do you give him an A overall, or do you think there are concerns about his record at this point? I think that Mary Garland's done a good job. Uh, you know, it, it's an easy thing for people on the outside to say, well, you should have done this, you should have done that. Uh, he has to deal with a number of things. He's got to deal with a political reality that, unfortunately, a, an attorney general now has to confront. It wasn't like that, you know, in the, in the old days. Uh, but I saw that start to grow with Janet Reno's time as attorney general, and I was the deputy attorney general. And there has been an increasing amount of pressure, political pressure, brought to bear on an attorney general. And that you just have to kind of push back to the extent that you can. But you also want to make sure that the American people have faith in you as an attorney general and also in the Justice Department. You want to look fair as best you can. So I think that Merrick has made the right calls with regard to the appointment of special counsels um, in the appropriate cases. My hope would be that once these special counsels get this power, that they use it appropriately. And I don't think that Mr. Hur has.